I stopped by this random soccer field in New Jersey today to see if there might be anybody flying a paraglider here today or a paramotor and to discuss the topic of density altitude with you folks. As a reminder, density altitude is calculated. It's your actual altitude corrected for temperature, pressure, and humidity. Once you've calculated your density altitude, you can assume that the aircraft is going to perform as if it is operating at that density altitude on a standard day. It's not as important to remember that a standard day is 29.92 inches of mercury on the barometer and 60 degrees as it is to understand the concept that it gives us a reference point, a baseline for performance calculations, a baseline for engine thrust and engine horsepower manufacture, and a baseline for comparing days that are hotter and more humid and days that are colder, giving us even lower density altitudes than what we had measured. I had two events happen in the last week. First, I went out and flew with a new guy, or at least I had the intentions of flying with him, and he had a few launch failures. He complained that his motor wasn't making as much horsepower as it typically did due to the humidity and the heat. And I left the field with the assumption that, sure enough, he had failed his launch due to high density altitude. At the end of this video, we'll take a look at the video that I had captured of his takeoff that I hadn't looked at until after I'd gotten back home. And then secondly, I got a chance to get out and fly when it was 95 degrees one evening for takeoff. I flew around for about an hour and I came back in and landed when it was 93 degrees. Now, once again, this is not a comparison of how I did it right and the other guy did it wrong. It's simply to illustrate the fact that density altitude might not have been the culprit. Aside from the fact that my climb out once I got airborne was rather anemic in this high heat takeoff, the ground handling portion and the ground takeoff run and the engine thrust at takeoff was pretty much well recognizable and near the parameters of what I've typically experienced all summer long. So what gives? So I pulled up the local weather after I got done flying and I took all of the parameters from the hourly surface observation at the Columbia Metropolitan Airport and plugged them into an online calculator for density altitude that I found. Come to find out my field density altitude for my takeoff was about 2,500 feet or about 2,000 feet higher than the field elevation itself. I urge you to find one of these calculators and play around with the numbers. That means the wing, the motor, and the propeller system are going to perform as if you're flying at 2,500 feet. The slight crosswind landing was also at about 94 degrees Fahrenheit, and aside from the wing being just a little bit mushier than normal, everything was well within the expected parameters. Paragliders clear of all run. So how was it then that I left the field with the belief that my new young friend had failed his takeoff with density altitude being the culprit? It was mostly the power of suggestion. The bottom line, however, is I no longer believe that that was the case. I even got into a deep discussion with a group of fellow South Carolina pilots that participate on a Facebook discussion page and one of the instructors there challenged me to prove that density altitude was in fact the culprit. And the more he challenged me, the harder time I had justifying that that's actually what happened. So I looked online and I found some aircraft performance charts that have absolutely nothing to do with paramotors. Why? Because I wanted to see what type of a percentage of performance fall off occurred with a 20 degree temperature change or 2,000 or 2,500 foot altitude change with regard to density altitude. There's just too many variables in 
pilot physical performance to be able to compile charts like this for paramotors. It just simply doesn't work. These two charts concur with about a 2,000 foot increase in density altitude. The takeoff roll increases about 7 to 10 percent. We're talking about 7 to 9 percent additional takeoff run. What that means is if your sea level takeoff run was 100 feet it's now going to be 109 feet. That's three more steps. So therefore, the failures of a takeoff can't really be blamed on density altitude unless you're talking about radical differences in altitude, temperature, and you're just not used to taking off at 6,000 feet density altitude because you always take off at sea level on a cool morning. And now one day you're out in Utah and it's 2,500 foot mean sea level and it's 90 degrees. Now you're going to have a problem. But if you're talking about operating from your home field where you took off yesterday morning and it was fine and this afternoon it's a little bit warmer, you better be looking at your technique as a reasoning for failure of your takeoffs, not density altitude. So I thought, well, I had driven almost an hour to get there to fly with him and it didn't look like he was either in the condition mentally or physically to try a third attempt and I advised him not to. I advised him to take a little bit of time and think about what had happened. Maybe give some consideration to a different approach or a different tactic and for the sake of safety don't push for an immediate third attempt with a soaking wet wing using the same techniques that failed the first two times. So I thought, well, I'll pull my wing up and see. Well, there was now enough of a breeze for a reverse attempt. The wing came up overhead. I got spun around. I got the motor spooled up, and I took two steps, and I realized that by the time I ran to flying speed, I would have eaten up at least 50% of the field length between myself and the trees that were the obstacle at the end of the field. So, two steps into the takeoff run, I eased off the throttle, let the wing come down behind me, and decided that it just wasn't going to be a warning that I was going to fly out of that location, given those winds, given those obstacles. But I still had left the field, fully believing that density altitude was the reason. Until I looked at the video. It's pretty clear in the video. The real failure is not density altitude, is not a lack of horsepower. It was an unsettled takeoff with a takeoff run different from the direction the wing was flying and getting airborne in a turn and not holding that turn but trying to turn back to level when the side of the wing that needed to be flying wasn't even flying yet. The important point here is that any discussion on what we thought the problem might have been at the field versus what it actually turned out to be because of video analysis really needs to come down to the fact that I want to see everybody engaged in this activity take a critical eye to what they're doing and how to do it better and how to do it more safely. So here's the video that's not about density altitude. So we got a little better breeze this time. That's going to help. His wing might be wet. And it looks like he's decided he's going flying. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt. There wasn't even so much as a scratch on his propeller or frame. Oh, and by the way, some of the locals did show up and fly out of that soccer field.